thank you for coming. Uh, today we'll be uh, talking with uh, John about his novels. Um, <coughs> I will be talking mainly about um, the novels that I've read, um, that is uh, the spy novels and the uh, book that I've just uh, finished, which impressed me a lot, The Last Banquet. Um, so, uh, welcome. Uh, John. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start with uh, the spy novels. So, um, the story, the, there are two novels. Uh, one is called Moskva, the other one is uh, Nightfall Berlin. And there is continuity between the stories. Uh, the story is centered on this character, um, Major Tom Fox, right? Um, <coughs> what many things um, intrigued me about these novels, I uh, will be talking about them, but uh, the character, the protagonist, he is a very interesting character. He um, was a Catholic priest before he became a major in the army, and he was involved, deeply involved, with the troubles in Ireland. Yes. Right? And the stories themselves take place in Moscow, in East Berlin, um, it's the Cold War context. Why did you fit this background? Why did you put the background of the troubled Ireland and uh, the problems uh, in Ireland in a cold, cold war context? Is there a connection or just the need to give him a background of some sort? It's a bit of both. I wanted to give, I wanted to give Tom a hinterland. I wanted to give him a proper grown-up background so he had a life before the book began so that you didn't simply have a character who springs onto the page, he's got a whole background. The Troubles in Ireland were a hugely, hugely complicated thing, and I wanted to put a man into it who basically knew that nothing he ever did was going to be right, but he was going to do it anyway. And I wanted him to have that conflict, and I, I wanted him to carry with him the darkness that came from that. And also it was in slightly playing with sides and with sides between the Cold War and the people. The people you have in common, the things you have in common with the people that you like. And I always remember someone saying to me that someone within Western intelligence saying to me that he had substantially more in common with his opposite numbers in East in Soviet intelligence than he did with his own bosses in London. Mm. And I wanted that sense of ambiguity and, you know, Tom is a Catholic priest. He's a Catholic priest who has then lapsed. He's now married. He has a, back, he has a background growing up in a, child, in a children's home. He has a marriage that he got somebody pregnant. They married. So it's not even a very simple marriage. Um, and then he goes into the army. He, reinvents himself as Major Tom Fox, which... But you never lose who Tom was in the children's home, you never lose who Tom was on the streets, in disguise, working for a shadowy operation out of White Ball in Belfast through the really terrible years of the early 70s. Mm -hmm. But um, the religion thing is quite prominent, especially in Moscow. Um, there's a, he is sent there, presumably, to study um, the state of religion in the Soviet yes. Union. That is the excuse. That's why they sent him. And um, right in the beginning of the book, he mentions a film by Tarkovsky. He's talking, actually, um, at some reception. And they talk about, uh, what's the name of that film? Um, Andrei Rublev. Yes. And uh, a part in Andrei Rublev where they, um, there's this scene with pagans Mm -hmm. hiding in the forest at the time when uh, Orthodox Christianity um, uh, was the main religion, of course. And um, he mentions this word, Vajodvelje, double faith. Yes. Um, uh, one hidden, one main faith, and that kind of combines, no, doesn't it? I mean, the, the double faith in Ireland, the possibility of faith in uh, 
um, in the Soviet Union itself. Um, one of the characters, a very mysterious uh, character in the beginning, until we get to know her, um, she makes wax angels, right? Wax Angels was my beginning for these books. I had a single image, and my single image from Moscow was an old woman in rags, in enough rags that when she stood up and brushed the snow off herself, she looked like a crow rising out of the white. And she earns her living stealing candles from churches and carving them into wax angels, wax angels and selling them to tourists on the streets of Moscow, which is obviously illegal. Um, Wax Angel is my, is my indulgence in these books. Um, for me, she's the spirit of Moscow. She's, I mean, she turns out to be a lot of other things, but she is actually the personification of Moscow. She is the spirit of Moscow. And when I told Penguin this after the book, they were absolutely horrified and basically said, please don't tell anybody because we can't have any element of supernatural in these at all. Um, but for me, Wax Angel has always been between the two worlds. I mean, she's, she is a personification of the double faith. Double faith. She is ex-Politburo. She is a beggar. She is a Russian. She was a sniper at Stalingrad. And she works on the edge of the spirit world. So I, that's what I was trying to do. I wanted as many layers as I could possibly have, and then just put them into a straight, what was effectively a straight spy throw. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one other thing that struck me, and I think most uh, leaders would notice it, is that uh, there is, there are, there's um, almost a hierarchy. Uh, the, the way the references are um, to models are organized. You have um, the type of car that goes to pick up uh, a sergeant, the type of car that goes to pick up, and you have always the references to the make of the car, um, uh, the, the make of the weapons being used, um, uh, particularly impressive, in fact, one of the characters, Denisov, he has um, an iron leg, a prosthetic leg, made from a helicopter, the, scrap the scraps of a helicopter, and we even get to know the make of the helicopter. Um, uh, and it gives it a particular feel. I mean, it, it's, uh, the description of Moscow is very real, um, very exact. Uh, the detail is amazing. And yet you have this feel that you're running through the Soviet Union, um, like through a show of models. Um, th this is my impression. I, need, I always need to uh, stability is the wrong word. I need certainty to nail the novel down. I need to know that the things that are real are real, and then I can lie about the rest. And nailing it down gives me the freedom to do everything else, but I have to have it nailed down. Also, I get really bored with books where someone walks in with a gun, and I want to know, you know what gun, where did they get it? You know, not just what are they going to do with it, but who had it before, you know, who's going to have it afterwards. So for me, nailing down those things actually really matters. And also, I suspect that I construct my books around items. So I put the city into place, I put the cars in the city. And the Soviet Union at that time was incredibly, incredibly hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And you did get different cars, and you did get different washing machines and you did get different levels of flats and I had a friend who flew down to Georgia and flew down to Georgia on a plane with someone reasonably high up within the Soviet system and it was the most luxurious plane you had ever seen you know and they served brandy and they had amazing amazing food and when they mentioned it to someone else they categorically denied that it was remotely possible that something like this could exist. Yeah. So it was there, but it simultaneously wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, the violence, or um, sometimes uh, graphically described, sometimes intimated, 
threatened, like in uh, Nightfall Berlin, when he has his interrogation. You feel the threat all the time, that mm -hmm. he's going to get beaten. He gets beaten up eventually, and yeah. not as much as you'd expect. But always there's this sense, this dread, uh, which you create uh, quite um, effectively. Uh, in uh, the last scenes of uh, Moskva, where, um, uh, I don't want to give away the story anyway, it, it happens in a slaughterhouse um, uh, on an island. It's uh, isolated, frozen, totally in snow. Um, uh, What thematic value does violence have in this kind of uh, novel, in, uh, in this genre? I think the violence you're describing, you're actually describing two things. You're describing the threat of violence, which for Tom is substantially more terrifying than the actual violence. He's been through actual violence. He knows he can and will survive actual violence. Um, from his childhood and from later on the streets in Belfast. For him, the threat of it is much more important. By the time you're getting to the end of the book, you're effectively at the end of the film. And then, I mean, it's not exploding cars and overturning tankers, but it is within the snowfields, within the individual context. It's that. Okay. So it's doing two very, very different things. One of them is about Tom's emotional state, whether he can actually hold out under interrogation, what he expects to happen next, whether anybody even knows he's where he is. The other one is literally, you're ramping up the final scene. I mean, violence is incredibly difficult to write. Yes. It's incredibly difficult to write without making it gratuitous, and it's incredibly difficult to write without making it completely Hollywood and actually meaningless. So it has to have a context and it has to have an after effect and it has to leave people changed by it. So you're, you know, you throw the stone into the water but you have to describe the ripples to this. Mm. And uh, besides the violence, the actual violence or the tension, there are also the characters and there are some pretty scary characters, especially in Moskva, um, the, uh, the people who kidnap the daughter of the ambassador. Um, uh, and also in Nightfall Berlin, although this is uh, related, it's, it's quite different kind of um, evil, if you mm -hmm. like, it's the evil of a hidden society. Um, uh, do you believe um, that evil is a category, a realistic category that can describe people in reality, or is it just a trope? Or That's a really, really difficult question. I, mean, I tend not to believe in evil. I tend not to believe that pure evil actually exists. And then very occasionally something happens or you read something and I wonder if it does. I mean, obviously in terms of novel, you want mm -hmm. evil to exist. I mean, mm -hmm. And also if you have a psychopath, you know, mm -hmm. is your psychopath a psychopath or is your psychopath actually evil? It's a you know, mm -hmm. it's a theological discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> if we turn now to look at The Last Banquet, which is um, the book I read last. For this one, by the way, we have omitted to mention something very important. You change names yes. in novels, right? So for the um, uh, spy novels, you are Jack Grimwood. I'm Jack Grimwood because Jack apparently is a very good spy name. Okay. <laughs> uh, for the last banquet, and these novels, you are um, Jonathan Grimm. Yeah. Okay, and we were talking uh, about it before. My assumption was that you change names because it's a kind of game on your part. You do it um, even for yourself, maybe to signal that um, you've changed uh, as a writer when you change it when you change on, but actually it turns out um, that's not exactly true, right? No, I write under three names. I write as Jack Grimwood for the spy novels. I write as Jonathan Grimwood for the literary stuff. And I write as John Courtney Grimwood for the alternative history, the fantasy, and the 
kind of post cyberpunk science fiction. This is purely a publisher's decision. Um, and it's a publisher's decision because they need to sell it into the bookshops. And the bookshops need to know where it's got to go. And we had one disaster where they sold in one of the books. That was SF, mostly SF, as crime. So it was wrapped in crime. And all the SF people couldn't find it because they didn't look in crime. All the crime people who read it didn't like it because it was SF. So it, that wasn't a mistake that got repeated. And from the point of view of publishing, they can say, this is a spy thriller and it's Jack Grimwood. And the bookshops will go out and they'll go, what did the last Jack Grimwood do? Let's look at the reviews, let's look at the sales figures. That's fine. And then for the Jonathan Grimwood, it's different because it's, no one's going to be looking at what Jack Grimwood did, it's going to be what did that do. Mm -hmm. It was their decision so that it got wrapped in the right place in the bookshops. And it was their decision so that it got reviewed in the right places mm -hmm. in the relevant bits of the paper. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care. I would be very, very happy to write everything under one name. But whereas 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that would probably be allowed, now it's not. Mm -hmm. You literally can't swap from 22nd century Napoleonic France to 18th century France to 15th right. century Venice to right. 21st century Tokyo because your readers probably aren't going to follow you uh -huh. and the bookshop's going to get too cross to actually stop you. Uh -huh. That's interesting because it shows how the book industry has changed. Has changed. Yeah. Okay. So, as Jonathan Grimwood, um, uh, you wrote uh, The Last Banquet, um, a novel that impressed me a lot. Um, it made me think of uh, Patrick Suskind's um, uh, perfume. But the characters are different, but both in both cases we have characters who have this uh, developed sense, in the case of uh, Suskin's novel, it's smell, in your case it's taste. And taste comes, an obsession with taste comes to shape his life. Right? Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning we meet him as a child, he's uh, picking up dung beaters and yes. eating them. Um, uh, later on he joins uh, society, he climbs up the ladder, right? And um, he starts pursuing stranger and stranger tastes, trying out different cuisines, different uh, recipes. And um, he makes it clear from the start that his obsession with taste is not hunger. No. He separates them. It's almost a taste for taste, right? Yes, he is, collect he is literally collecting tastes. Uh -huh. And he's working his way to everything he can eat. And very quickly he starts keeping notes of what something tastes like and where he found it, when he ate it. It's, I mean, this is set in the, in, set in the Enlightenment, it's set in the run-up to the French Revolution. It's about the, the encyclopedist, it's about taxonomy, it's about the point at which, you know, the table, the tables were being produced for science and physics, and he wanted to do the same for taste. He wanted, he wanted a periodic table of taste. Yes, in fact. And to do that, he had to eat everything he could find, and define it. So nothing was missing from his periodic table. Everything that could be tasted, he would taste. And this coincides with the expir you know, with an expiration, as we described it then, of the world. So animals are being sent to the court, animals being sent to the zoo at Versailles. And he begins to work out how he can eat the animals that are coming in, if he hasn't seen them before, and then how he can note it. And, and it's very much about, it's about acquisition, but it's about escalation. It's about a need to inquire, inquire and acquire and consume. It's about, you know, obviously, I'm talking about our age as much as I'm actually talking about the run-up to the Napoleonic era and the French Revolution that comes slightly before that. I, mean, I think we're on the edge of history and whatever happens next, we don't know, but it will happen. In the same way that no one in the book knows that the French Revolution will happen. And most of the people in that book will be dead within very few pages after the book finishes. 
Uh -huh. In fact, um, he even theorizes on the basis of things. He theorizes about how um, it's possible to convince people, men, to do certain things by giving them certain kinds of food. Yes. It's very, um, it's a clear allusion to science and to um, the scientific revolution. Yes, you know, can you make a country warlike by feeding it only meat? Can you make it Pacific by feeding it potatoes? I mean, which incidentally were illegal to eat at that point. And one of the things is they had been forbidden by the church because it was thought that they might well be poisonous. And one of the scenes in the book is he cooks and eats a potato, which is actually illegal to prove that it won't poison him. Mm -hmm. right? So there's the, the clash with religion as well. Yes, yes, I mean, he's... Um, regarding the um, special meaning of taste in this context, because um, the taste for the exotic, the taste for more, or for um, new experiences, this is of course, or it can be read as an allusion to our times, right? Mm -hmm. We also, um, in conjunction with um, consumerism, the obsession with gaining more or what is exotic or newer, trying new things. And it's having something and then what you have not being enough. Mm -hmm. You have to have something else and it has to be more complicated, more difficult to get. And when you've got that, you have to have something else. And that's how he works his way up the animal kingdom, trying to get something different each time, getting it, defining it, and then needing the thing after that. I mean, it's a book about obsession. It's totally a book about obsession. Uh -huh. But the, he, on the other hand, is not a freak no. or an outcast in the same way that Jean-Baptiste of uh, Perfume is. He's quite well adjusted. He can fit in society. He passes well in society. I mean, he begins sitting, you know, as you mentioned, he's sitting in, he's sitting in a courtyard in a ramshackle farm, farmhouse with his back to a dunghill eating the dung beetles when he's found at the beginning and his parents have starved to death in the house behind him. And he slowly works his way into society. He slowly works his way up until he, until he becomes the zookeeper at Versailles. Which obviously is a noble position and you have to pay to acquire it, but he has the right friends who allow him to do that. And he gets his way into society and of course he hates it more and more and more and more as he works his way up the list. So he's becoming ever grander, ever richer, ever more successful. He's getting everything he wants to eat. He puts himself into a position where he can send, you know, to the East Indies for something he thinks. Yeah. He's heard of that he wants sent back so he knows what it tastes like. But at the same time, he's beginning to despise not simply the society around himself, but himself for being in, this, in the society that surrounds him. And Versailles is a prison. I mean, Versailles is really interesting because Versailles had in the middle a zoo in which the animals were imprisoned. And then in the outer circle of Versailles, the courtiers were imprisoned. And it was a really clever idea. You basically take the courtiers and you completely neuter them by making them spend all their money and all their time trying to impress each other in a tiny, tiny, tiny little space. And that's like squalid. I mean, it was really squalid. Um, people pissed in the corridors. No one ever cleaned anything. There weren't any loud trips. I mean, you could walk down a corridor and your clothes would be completely foul by the time you got to the other end of it for the stuff that had gone on. So it's this amazing luxury. It's this amazing privilege and this absolute scholar. In fact, um, when the count who he meets in the beginning takes him to offer him some food, he, knows, he notices lice in his hair, in his wig, and he says, he starts thinking about cooking lice, right? Yes. Um, <coughs> I was intrigued by one thing. Um, his contact with the animals is not just about eating. Actually, at the end, he realizes that the only being that he has probably loved was the blind tiger. Yes. And um, it made me think because um, 
his contact with the animals and the fact, you know, there are references in the novel to Voltaire and Rousseau. He's something of the noble savage, in a sense, of Rousseau, right? And uh, it's significant that his best friend, or the only... The only friend, true friend he has is, is, a is, is a blind tiger that he picks up as a calf. And then it's an unfeasibly, unfeasibly long-lived blind tiger for the purposes of the novel, which, again, nobody picked up. And which I liked because it allowed me to put in the magic realist elements that I wanted to put into the book without making them really obvious. So there are quite obvious magic realist elements in that book. But at no point does it scream, you know, look at this tiger. tiger that has lived twice as long as all tigers and obviously personifies something that isn't simply tigerness. <coughs> the um, point of view, though, of the narrator remains very cold. Right? There is a certain distance yes. from. Um, uh, can you elaborate on that? Why was it important to keep this distance? I mean, we never really. We see all of his life from the beginning to the end, linear, um, uh, expounded as well, but we don't really get to see any of his. to touch and feel any of his emotions. Partly this is because I wanted someone who was purely interested in the scientific method and wanted a distance from life. Partly, I suspect that actually we look at that now and we look at him and we think this is this very cold, very precise man, but I suspect that for the time he would probably have been quite touchy-feely. I mean, it's a society in which, you know, husbands and wives bowed in courtesy to each other each morning when they met for the first time, dressed, going down to the grand rooms. He begins his life like that, he learns that, and then later he unlearns it um, with the second great love of his life. I mean, quite obviously the great, great love of his life is the tiger, but he learns it. And I try to suggest, I mean, I try to suggest emotion without actually his emotion is repressed, his depression is amazingly repressed. There's a scene in which he walks his heels into a bloody mess. But that's the only way you know that he's upset. Mm -hmm. He doesn't cry, he doesn't scream, he doesn't break things, he doesn't shout at people. He just walks until his feet bleed. Um, regarding the different genres and uh, your um, plans uh, for future novels, so um, do you plan to keep exploring the three different genres that you have explored? So with spy novels, with uh, I have novels? The next thing I'm writing is a standalone novel set in a small island off the coast of France in 1940 that was occupied by the Germans, but was British and was owned directly by the king. And it's a crime novel, so it's what happens if there's a crime. Um, in an island occupied by the Germans, owned directly by the King of England. I mean, it's got other elements to it, but for me that's where I came into that novel. So I've got that, and then after that I've got a large Tom Fox, which is set in the very north of Norway, where the north of Norway borders Russia. And there was about 160 miles of really soft border between the two countries that, by general agreement, was largely filled with Western soldiers walking up this side and Soviet soldiers walking up this side and the reindeer just coming through the birch forests between. So it's the most porous forest in border in Europe at that point. And I want a novel set in that, in that before. I mean, I lived in Norway for a while. Um, I really like the very far north and I wanted to Right, something also I just wanted the idea of pinning something to set it all in the run up to total darkness. So by the end of the book, you've just got 24 hour you know, black. Which great. And the other thing I've done is, uh, well, I've done a couple of things. One of them is a uh, love story across time involving Joan of Arc and Gilles de Ray and John Milton and a couple of other people, and it takes place in, well, the title of the book is Heaven, Hell, and Mexico City, so obviously 
takes place in heaven, hell, and Mexico City. And again, it's incredible. And I've had immense fun playing with that and researching that and taking Paradise Lost and then working out, okay, if Paradise Lost is actually the expurgated version of that book, what did Milton write in the original? And so it's, it's about that. Um, yeah. Who would you say are the authors? We do get a very good idea who are your, um, uh, what kind of literature you like, even from the spine of this, particularly from the spine of this. There are references to Mayakovsky, references to Burkakov. Um, uh, are these. And I, and I just say, I, I sneak those in. Mm. And then they take them out, and then I sneak them in again. <laughs> but they left quite a few. So. They left. I was quite cross by how many they took out, whereas I suspect they were quite you know, cross by how many they had to leave in. So. <laughs> Um, are these thrown in, these names, to, um, because they're inspired by the novel or by the story, the, or do you actually um, uh, the master, adapt these authors? The Master Margarita by Bulgakov is an absolutely astonishing novel. Yeah. And it was the novel, for me, that made sense of life. I was, no, I was sent away to school when I was seven. No, I came from Malta to if, a million six. I came from Malta to a cold, dark, dank English boarding school and wondered what the hell had happened and didn't cope very well with it and didn't behave very well at all. And when I was about 13, one of my aunts who was, you know, hard drinking, hard smoking, basically threw me a copy of Bulgakov's and Marshall Marguerite and said, read this. And I read it. And it's astonishing, it's, he had the misfortune to be Stalin's favorite playwright, which meant that he couldn't go into exile. On the other hand, he was unlikely to be killed. Um, he wrote the Master Margarita, which involves a gun-toting, swearing, cigar-smoking cat in Moscow and the devil, working their way through Moscow, wrecking absolute havoc. And I read this, and Everything made perfect sense. And it was actually a transformative experience because reading that book told me that one life didn't have to make sense, two, it could be as absurd as you like and you could still take something out of it. I mean, the other thing is that I'm married and the person I'm married to, I'm married to because we walked across the bridge together in the fog and we got talking in the book we talked about was some Bulgarkov's Marshall Margarita, which, you know, she had just started reading, and we had an argument as we walked across the bridge on whether it was harder to read it in translation or whether it was harder to read it in the distance, in time between when we were and when it was written. And so it was a... So it kind of has a huge sentimental value, but it had a value for me beforehand from when I was a child or when I was in my early teens. Uh -huh. And um, uh, do you feel that... Have you reread it since then? Did you feel I re it or reread it? I reread it all the time. I have, like, I have 14 or 15 different editions of it going right back to early editions. Every new edition that comes out, we buy. Okay. Um, we tend to buy two of them. And I mean, we've got Russian ones, and we've got... You know, if a new edition of Bulga comes out, one or the other of us will buy it, because it's just Bulga. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, are there any um, questions? No. No. Um, there are the books outside. I think. Um, uh, where are the council people? Anyway, um, outside there should be the books, uh, <laughs> and they're for sale as well at the main stand outside. Uh, thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.